hit a bunch of A minor chords. And if you look at the keyboard, I'm mostly playing the same notes, but it's gonna sound like there's more variation going on. But you hear it sounds a bit different sometimes. And if I start mixing this in with other chords, This patch is about as simple as it gets. The setting we're looking at is specifically the voice setting. So I've set it up here in a very basic configuration um, to demonstrate how voicing in Twin 3 works because it's a little bit different than a lot of other synths. So even if you're familiar with these settings, this may help explain a few things uh, for how this works. So there are these different modes called the voicing modes. And when you hit a note, Twin 3 has to decide how it's gonna generate that note. It's got a set of oscillators it can use to generate that note. And there are different modes for how it interprets the voices. So on the one side, the voices sometimes has to do with the number of oscillators that it uses. And sometimes it just has to do with the number of notes being hit. So for example, I am in mono mode and I have a unison of one. I have a voice limit of one. So when I hit a note, is it going to generate just using one oscillator or is it going to generate using all four oscillators? Again, we have a unison of one. So this is like when we hit one note, it's got one voice to use. The way Twin 3 does it is it interprets all the oscillators together for one note as one voice when you're in mono mode. So if I hit a note, we hear all four. And I've, I've split up their octaves so that you can clearly hear they're all there. And if we increase our unison to say two, we still only hear one copy of these oscillators because this is interpreted as one voice. If we were to increase this to two, we will now hear two copies of this oscillator. And you can modify how different it is using the spread. So the spread will cause a pitch difference and it will also cause some panning differences, making it sound wider. So, and again, in mono mode, it's interpreting all of this as a single voice. So there'll be one copy of all of this and one and as one voice and another one. And we can cause those differences to occur between them. So if we have a very low spread, it will be very phasey because the waves will be very similar to each other. And if we open it up, yeah, and you can modulate this, by the way, which can be a fun thing to touch. But that's how it works in mono mode. Now, if we go to poly mode, and again, we go back to that one, one case. So we're saying, hey, we hit a note, one is available. What do we hear? If we hit a note, we hear them all again. So it's the same deal, only in monophonic mode, you're limited to only playing a single note. Um, so for example, monophonic, if I start like playing between multiple notes, you can see on the keyboard, I was holding those down, but no change happened. In poly mode, uh, a change will happen. But we've hit the voice limit. And this is an important, a really important thing to understand with poly mode. Um, Unison says we get one of these, but we've set a voice limit of one. Meaning once you've capped the voice limit, it it can't use any more voices. And so it sounds just like poly mode. So if we want to be able to play more notes, we have to give it more voices to use. So we could say, hey, you know, we'll put four. So this essentially means if each note gets one voice and there are four voices total, um, every time we add a note, it'll, it'll take up one of those voice slots. So now we can play up to four notes, but when I hit that fifth, it's gonna have to give up one of the notes and the way Twin 3 does it is it gives up the last note you played. So here's one, two, three, four. You can hear how we start losing the lower notes as we go uh, higher. And, you know, we, we've got our spread to set up a little bit if we give it a bigger spread. So if you want to be able to have a lot of notes, you could go up to 64. And, you know, that's a good time. Uh, you, you could play a ton of notes. You'll very likely never run out of this issue. So 
what gets interesting is when we start modifying this unison value. So if we put it at, say, four, now let's go to two. We'll go to two for an hour spread. You should be able to hear this pretty easily. So right now we've got two. It's going to interpret this whole stack as a voice, remember. So each time we hit a note, it'll take up two voices. So that, when the unison is saying, how many voices does it get? Well, it'll get two. So I hit a note. We're generating two of those voices. If I hit a second note, we're now taking up four voices. And this is where the voice limit could be really significant, right? So if we have something like, you know, each one takes up eight voices, we get a way bigger sound. And you know what? Uh, I'm tired of the high end. <laughs> we want to hear it a little bit. And then if we bring those thread down, it's going to be very um, phasey and not nearly as wide. And if you open it up, it's very wide and the, the pitch will be all over. But it tends to average out as you add more and more voices. So if you want to go straight to the max, this is a monophonic patch, but it'll be generating 64 copies of this. <laughs> yeah, which, uh, you know, you're probably not going to want to do. But it, the fact you can go up to 64, I find pretty freaking awesome. Usually the limit is much lower. Um, so, okay, we'll, we'll, we'll come down to, let's go for four. So each one will get four. And now let's look at the last option. So that's the poly, the way poly behaves. And then the last option, this is where it gets kind of interesting. So let's go to one to one per oscillator changes how it views voices. Voices are no longer the entire thing. Now voices are interpreted as single oscillators. What's interesting is as you add notes, it will distribute the voices and give them to the next oscillator. So it almost acts like a sequencer as well. So again, one unison, one voice, but now it'll be just this first oscillator. See it working? I'll play a second note while holding the first one. It's never able to get to the next one because we don't have enough voices for it to get to the next one. So if we give it more voices, like let's say we give it four, I hit a note, And you can see it distributes those. And as I continue to play notes, let's change the waveforms on these. We'll make this one a square, this one a triangle, and this one a sine wave. And I'm going to go ahead and, and I'm going to hold down the pedal and play through a few notes. One, two, three, four. You can kind of see how this works. Now, if we give each one two, it's going to generate two copies of that specific oscillator. And as we hit more notes, now we have a voice limit of four, so it's going to have to start giving up voices as we move. And this can actually be a cool thing to mess with. Check it out. We've limited ourselves to the first two oscillators. If we go ahead and bring it up to something like eight, we begin to have the other oscillators uh, get involved. Now, what I was doing at the start was I had something like four and a voice option. I don't know. Let's put it up. I, I can't remember what my exact settings were. But let's put it at like 20. And let's take these all down to a similar range, like 16. Maybe we'll bring this down to minus one. That's fine. And as I play notes, the order my hands come down on the keys isn't going to be exactly the same every time causing the voices to redistribute themselves in interesting ways. So if you're writing with a mouse, uh, then you want to be like changing the start of how the notes line up just a little bit. And that can cause these variations to occur. I'll hit it again. Again. And the voices, these different waveforms are being distributed in different ways. So if I go ahead and play something a little more sophisticated, You know, it distributes in a cool way. And then you could record it in and you could try and maybe uh, finesse it. Because 
because it is determined by whatever the last notes you hit were, you can get it to land a certain way. So now you should understand the voice settings. I'd like to talk a little bit about music theory real briefly because it'll explain why the chords change the way they do. So if you're unfamiliar with music theory, there's this concept called the inversion in music theory. A large, if you were to really go to the more advanced version, there's this thing called voicing, which is also a big deal. But essentially, if we have three notes, the lowest sounding note will be the inversion. And changing this can have a dramatic effect on how we perceive the chord. And there's all these things you're taught about in like an official music theory book on the role of uh, different notes. Like if you have this chord, C major, and you have E as the lowest note, that's going to be called first inversion. And it's going to do all these, it's going to do certain jobs better. It's a little, little less stable than when C is the root note. And then if you had G as the root note, that's the least stable position. And this causes it to maintain some of its uh, unstableness, meaning it's good for continually moving to a new thing, which is, could be why this sounds kind of cool. So when we prioritize our waveforms in different ways when we hit these notes, like maybe we hit the note C and it gets this top one, but then our second note gets this octave down one. So this will put it down so that the second note is the root position, not the root position, is the lowest note, putting us in first inversion. And so we occasionally get these voice movements, in this case, an inversion change, which is a lot more significant for how we perceive the chord a lot of the time. Um, and that's why it can sound kind of cool. So I just kind of wanted to explain why the effect works the way it does. And you might pick the octave down voice to be something different based on that like maybe you want the lowest voice to always be a sine wave so we could come in here and pick it to be a sine wave because this waveform is in the second position i think it's going to be a little more likely for most piano players to accidentally be putting in first inversion things because the next note you hit will either be the third if you're playing it up a standard arpeggio or if you're doing a of uh, going up by an octave and then a fifth and then up, you wind up with second inversion. So the chance of you getting a root position thing is a lot less likely now. And that can be an interesting thing. Maybe you're not used to having those things. It can be a bit refreshing. I, I have to like really deliberately <laughs> play the root as the second note in order to get a, a root position thing assuming I'm starting and letting go of all the notes and then starting the next chord. If I'm holding notes down, then it's a lot more difficult to track what the inversion is going to be. But that's kind of how this one works and why I think it can be a really interesting one to use, especially on chord style patches. If you have any questions about Unison, feel free to drop them down below. Subscribe to that bell icon for future videos and have a blessed day.